the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to him, What should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not. For the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. We left off last week. We left Jonah at sea after he had heard from the Lord and had willingly turned from that word and He was in process of fleeing from the presence of God. Jonah, the prophet of the Most High, heard these words, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. And when this prophet of the Most High heard these words, he rose up to flee to Tarshish. He was commanded to go in the way of the Lord, and he chose to go in the way of Jonah. God said, arise and go to Nineveh. Jonah arose in order to flee to Tarshish. God's revealed will was plain, inescapably avoidable. It didn't lack clarity, and Jonah's desired will was Exactly the opposite of what God had commanded. And as Jonah sought to do his own thing, there must have been some confusion in his mind because he knew he was going against what God had commanded. But there's these convenient doors that were opening up. I mean, if God didn't want Jonah to go to Tarshish, surely there would not be a ship sailing that afternoon. Surely Jonah would be short just a few pennies of what was required to pay the fare if God really didn't want him to go. But there was a ship sailing, sailing away, not away from God's presence as Jonah wished, 
but away from God's will to Jonah's detriment. And that fateful afternoon, that was good enough for Jonah. Jonah had chosen at this point to be guided by the general divine providences of God, though he was unwilling to be guided by God's word. Which is helpful for us. We too must be incredibly careful not to be driven or swayed by the mere general or divine circumstances that we find around us, especially when we are unwilling to be guided by the scriptures and the principles that we find there. The events of our life, the events of your life, must not be the compass that you live by. Or that you sail by since we're in the boat on the sea with Jonah this morning. Especially if you have not taken the word as a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. Now let's pick up with Jonah right where we left him last week. If you remember, we left him sailing in the tumultuous waters both spiritually and literally. Spiritually, Jonah was sliding. Backsliding is the way the psalmist says it. Further and further away from God's plan for his life. But he wasn't just spiritually in trouble. He was physically, or we may say literally, in trouble because he was assuming all was well. To such a degree that he had pulled up some floor in the bottom of the ship and laid down to take a nap. And then it begins to unravel. We begin to see as we move on in our story that Jonah's disobedience has led to the disintegration of everything around him. You may have noticed last week, and we're doing it again this morning because it's a huge narrative here, or or a small narrative, if you will, just four chapters. But we're taking the story as a whole and then plucking out or noticing the applicable details that are helpful along the way. We were in chapter one last week. We're only going to be in chapter one again today, just taking the narrative, if you will, and reading it through a different lens. Pointing out three specific things. I said last week, Jonah was the writer, writing an autobiography. He's definitely an important player here. The fish, as we'll notice later, is quite interesting. But the major player in the text is God. And that's what I want us to see here today together. That God is responding as a result of Jonah's disobedience. God is revealing what's going on in Jonah's heart. And then God reacts finally to the situation towards the end of the chapter. God responds to Jonah's disobedience. Verse 4, He hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. God says to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, warn them of the impending wrath. Jonah goes in the other direction. And God, who is seated on his throne, doing all of his good pleasure, both then and now, who reigned as king at the flood and who still reigns today as king, hurls from heaven a great wind and a storm erupts on the sea. Jonah had accomplished five actions in his escape to attempt. He rose up to flee. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship. He paid the fare. He went down into it. And God responds with a single action. He hurls a great wind and a great storm on the sea. Now, taking advantage of this nautical scene that we have before us, let's look at an illustration, one from Scripture that will serve as a wonderful warning. The writer of Hebrews, writing to these Jews who are on the precipice, if you will, of turning back and going back to the old man-made religion 
giving in to the old ways, hoping in the shadows rather than the reality, giving in to the cultural Christianity all around them. That's the great danger of those Hebrew, that the Hebrew Christians were facing. And when God writes to them through the original author, he says this, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience proved, pardon, received a just penalty. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Jonah had failed to pay close attention to what he had heard. We looked at his pedigree last week. We noticed that he was a prophet of God, that he'd been used of God, that he had seen God relent concerning the coming wrath against the Israelites. We had seen the territory of Israel expanded as a result of the preaching of Jonah. But he failed to continue paying close attention to what God had said. And he, as a result, drifted from it. And the illustration that we looked at a few years back which helps bring this out more vividly, is not that we're supposed to be in the dock, hunkered down, tied to the cleats there, on the dock with the boat, waiting out the storm. The idea is that we drifted right past the harbor, and now we are wandering around at sea. We've lost the vision of getting into the harbor. The lighthouse is no longer there. It's hazy. There's reefs and barriers everywhere that are hidden. The only way we're going to get in is to stay focused and to keep our attention on Him. He's the only safety. But Jonah had not paid due attention to what he had heard, and he was drifting away. And the illustration that the writer of Hebrews uses that's so helpful, every word that has spoke, been spoken through the angels, that's the law that we looked at recently in Exodus all of that proved unalterable. When someone broke the law of God, they were condemned. They were judged. Every single transgression, the writer says, every disobedience received a just penalty. And that was under the old covenant. So how much more now in the new covenant, how in the world will you and I escape if we neglect so great, if we neglect so great a salvation? How will it be possible? And the implied answer to this rhetorical question is, we won't. If we do not pay closer attention to who he is and what he said, we will not escape. If we neglect the clear commands that he's laid out for us in the text, we won't escape. And that's where Jonah found himself. At sea, with no direction, and his life on the line, and not just his, but others as well. God responded to Jonah's disobedience, hurling a great wind, in order to get his attention, to remind him. God's response reveals three things about Noah. One, his conscience was obviously seared, and deemed ineffective as a result of it being seared. Jonah was obviously ashamed of his calling and the ministry that God had given him. And Jonah was also hopelessly despairing of his own life. First, his conscience was seared and as a result, ineffective. Can you imagine a couple of years before this? Maybe the day after Jonah made the great proclamation that we looked at in 2 Kings last week regarding the coming wrath of God if the people of Israel didn't repent and God, as a result, when they repented, expanded their territory. Jonah would have been, no doubt, in shock, in utter shock if he had known in just a few years he would end up in such a perilous condition. Unwilling to hear the word of God, unwilling to do the will of God, using everything in his power to escape the presence of God, yet here we find him doing just that, running from God. His life in great danger. 
And not just his, but all these sailors around him too who are the innocent ones. And to boot, Jonah's unconcerned. We find him in this miserable situation and he's absolutely unconcerned to the degree that he's sound asleep. The Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, includes in it the idea that he was so sound asleep, he was snoring. He had no concern for his own life, for the lives of the sailors, for the word of God, the will of God, the presence of God, the Ninevites, all 120,000 of them. He was unconcerned and chose to sleep to escape it all. When the word of God came to Jonah, his conscience was in no condition to adequately guide him. It had been seared. It's obvious that Jonah had been drifting spiritually for some time, drifting in his relationship with the Lord, not unknowingly, but progressively, progressively to the point that now he absolutely refused to hear the word of God due to his lack of concern for the will of God. And it's not just the clear voice of God that he's ignoring and that he can't hear and discern. Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh and proclaim the coming wrath. Jonah can't even hear the storm raging and the wind howling on the deck above him. He can't hear the sailors being fearful for their life. He's numb to it all. And it's at this point that the haunting echo from the past wakes him up there on the ship's floor. Get up. Call on your God. Arise. Go to Nineveh and cry against it. Jonah refused to listen to the clear word of the Lord. Misrepresenting the circumstantial providences of the Lord. And here is this captain without any knowledge of God whatsoever. And God uses him to rouse Jonah from this escapism tactic that he's put in place. Jonah had seared his conscience so that it proved ineffective. And this spiritually clueless, godless captain of the ship sounds more like a prophet than Jonah. Get up, he said. Call on your God. And notice these words. Perhaps your God, this clueless captain said, will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Those are words of a prophet. Return to me with all your heart. Another prophet named Joel. With fasting, weeping, mourning, rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for He's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Who knows whether He will not turn and relent. Perhaps He will be concerned about us, the clueless captain said, so that we will not perish. And here's the prophet of God saying, who knows whether He will not turn and relent. Jonah ineffective because of a seared conscience, being shamed by this clueless, godless captain coming to him saying, get up, maybe your God, all of our gods will not hear us. Maybe your God will hear and relent and turn and not do us harm. Not only is he shamed by this clueless captain that day, but he proves to be ashamed of his ministry, of the gospel, of God himself. The captain comes, wakes him from the sleep. Jonah wipes the drool from his chin, rubs the sleep out of his eyes, stumbles to the top deck, trying to shake the cobwebs out of his mind. And he's met there by sailors who are casting lots. Casting lots in order to discern the cause of this great calamity. And when the lot falls on him, they immediately begin peppering him with questions just rapid fire style. On whose account has this calamity struck us? What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? 
They're serious about finding out a source of the problem. They're serious about finding something to remedy the situation. Their lives depend on it. It's no wonder that they're peppering him with one question after the next. And Jonah obliges their request. Most of it anyway. He confesses his liability in the situation. He acknowledges his Hebrew heritage. He reveals to them his religion. But he avoided one of their questions entirely. What is your occupation? Jonah, a prophet of God, is not able to admit it. His witness, as a result of his disobedience, has been silenced. He had no word from God to give. He forfeited the prophetic word of the Lord, ashamed of his calling and of his ministry. And the outcome at this point in the story is inevitable. His conscience is seared. He's misinterpreting the voice of the Lord, misunderstanding the providences of the Lord. He's ashamed of who he is, of where he's come from, of how far he's fallen. It's no wonder that we find him in verse 12 in hopeless despair. Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Jonah had been such a complete failure. He felt totally useless. There was nothing left for him to do. I mean, don't you think that a prophet of God at this point would say, I'll pray to him. He's heard me before. Why don't I go back and pray again? There's nothing left for him to do. He says, throw me into the sea. He's despairing of his own life. He didn't know at this point whether he was a true servant or a prophet. Surely he has no confidence even of his sonship at this point. Why would he? How could you? Apart from obedience, is there any real assurance in the Christian life? The pagan sailors had more hope in this situation than Jonah. When Jonah said, pick me up and throw me into the sea, they didn't immediately respond by doing that. They actually rowed desperately. They began working harder to return to land. But they could not because the sea was becoming even stormier against them. And it's the, the sailors who end up calling on the Lord, not Jonah. Do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not put his innocent blood on us, they pray. They're pleading for pardon. And with the great plea for pardon to the God of Israel that they're beginning, it seems, to recognize as the God who made the heavens and the seas and the dry land, they throw Jonah into the sea. Verse 4, God had hurled a storm at Jonah. And now we find the sailors hurling Jonah at the storm in the sea. And with that tiny splash in light of the vast waters, the wrath of the storm ceases. It's as if someone was standing on the boat saying, Peace, be still. But the wrath of the storm didn't rest without cost. All of the wrath was absorbed, as it were, in one man. When Jonah falls into the sea, it's as if the wrath of God is quenched in his life. And the remarkable gospel glimpse here is of Christ. The one who took on the wrath of the many the sinners, us. God responds to Jonah's disobedience, hurling the great storm. God reveals the problem in Jonah's life, the multifold problem. And then God reacts 
God reacts by appointing a great fish to swallow this escaping prophet. I mean, what a reaction. Who could see it coming? I mean, if we've grown up in a Christian environment, we know Jonah like the back of our hand. So it's no surprise at all when the whale shows up and swallows Jonah and immediately, I mean, there's no question at all. We don't have to wait three days to find out what happens. Just when the fish is appointed, we know he's there three days and three nights and then he's out. But what a reaction on the part of God. Which one of us would plan it in that way? Someone that we had shown so much grace to, so much mercy to, so much love to, they turn and go their own way. Which one of us doesn't ordain the great white to come along and destroy him, shredding him into pieces? Isn't that what he deserved that day? Isn't that what we deserve most days? No one can see it coming. Jonah sinned. Jonah is punished. The sailors are safe. And that's the end of our story if we're the ones writing it. But we're not the ones writing it. Jehovah is. He's the author here. And his plans are not our plans. And his ways prove again and again to be better than our ways. And God reacts here. And when God reacts to a situation, mercy reigns every time. The fish was prepared by God and sent by God in judgment, yes, but it was not judgment without mercy. Now, I should point out here that this fish is incredibly interesting. But if we focus on the fish, we will lose sight of God. We lose sight of God at this point in the story where He is displaying mercy towards a sinner. Where He is displaying mercy toward the sailors. He displays mercy by swallowing the sinner. And it's amazing. Unbelievable, really. Unrepeatable. That Jonah would be preserved in the belly of the fish for such an extended period of time. But the real work of God was not in the belly of the fish. The most amazing work of God happened in the heart of the prophet. Who's in the belly of the fish. The miracle was not just, it was a miracle, but it was not just preserving this fledgling prophet for three days. But it was the restoration of a wayward child. And that's what we see happening here. Jonah coming to his senses. Which reminds us of a story that Jesus told. The prodigal son who had gone away and squandered with loose living. He came to his senses. Jonah in the belly of a fish. The prodigal. In the pen of a pig. He came to his senses and came home. And that's what we will see next time we're in Jonah together in chapter 2. Jonah was swallowed by a fish. And that is the judgment of God. Jonah was swallowed by a fish. And that's the mercy of God. How remarkable. This mercy that is shown to a wayward prophet. And not just mercy to the prophet. Remember the whole reason that Jonah is brought into this picture. Because God has an evangelistic heartbeat that's beating for the nations, for the Gentiles, for the pagans who are living in Nineveh. For people like you and me. That's why all the trouble has gone through to show mercy to this wayward prophet. Rather than just wiping him off the face of the earth and being done with him. And allowing it to be a great white rather than just a great fish. God's heart was beating with love, with compassion for the Ninevites. And he intended, with everything in him, he was resolved to use this seared, conscience, backslidden, despairing prophet as his instrument of choice to bring the Ninevites to repentance. Jonah's reluctance 
would not hinder the Ninevites' repentance. Jonah wasn't that big. He wasn't that strong. He's not that significant. And his reluctance failed. God did bring about repentance to the Ninevites, which we'll get to in chapter 3 in the future. God has mercy on Jonah, and then he shows mercy through Jonah to the Ninevites. Not only was the sinning prophet swallowed, but the sailors end up saved. I pointed it out briefly last week. The men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. It's just remarkable. Sailors who had never had a second thought, possibly never thought once about the God of Israel. And God, in his amazing providence, uses this wayward prophet in his disobedience and his attempt to escape the word and the presence of the Lord to bring these sinning sailors to himself. God's mercy really knows no bounds. These are rotten, wicked, good-for-nothing pagans. Yet in the kind providence of God, through Jonah's awful attempt at rebellion and escape, they find themselves on the receiving end of God's mercy and love. But the salvation didn't come without a cost. There's always a cost. Salvation comes to you and to me as a result of judgment. The prophet was indeed thrown overboard for the salvation of the Ninevites, for the salvation of the sailors. And the Son of God himself was crushed for the salvation of his enemies. The Ninevites were enemies. It's part of the reason that Jonah was so against. What happens if the Ninevites repent? These are enemies. They're already stronger. If now God is not against them, but has shown them kindness, Jonah is fearful for himself, for his own country. Wrongly so, but we can understand where it's coming from. They're enemies. And Jonah is shown judgment so that they can be shown mercy. The Son, Christ Jesus, unlike Jonah in so many ways, never disobedient, kept the law at every point, lived perfectly to his Father around every, in every circumstance. He was crushed. He absorbed. He was the one who quenched the wrath of God that was due all those who believe. They picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. But Jonah didn't see it that way. I mean, he lived it experientially. It's what happened to him. But when he's writing about this, when he finds himself in the belly of the fish, look at chapter 2, verse 4. I have been expelled from your sight, Jonah says. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Pardon, verse 3. You had me cast into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. You had me cast. When it happens in real time, it's the sinning sailors there throwing Jonah over the side of the ship. When Jonah looks back, Jonah recognizes God is in charge here. He's the one who is accomplishing all of his good pleasure. He's orchestrated in this way. He doesn't even say, God, you let them. But God, you cast me into the sea. You made it happen. You prepared this to happen. And he goes on and says, salvation is from the Lord. Jonah begins to recognize that all that God was doing was, the purpose, was for the purpose of his own salvation. This is not the first time in the scriptures that we see this come up. If you remember Joseph, his brothers, his unkind brothers, when some Midianite traders passed by, they pulled him up out of the well that they had thrown him in, lifting Joseph up out of the pit, sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, 
Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. When the psalmist writes about the story of God rescuing his people, he says, He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. God sent Joseph to Egypt. Sure, his wicked brothers were there and they were a part of it. Chapter 50 of Genesis, verse 20. Joseph even says to them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. We see behind the scenes of what's going on, God is working all things for the good of his people, for the glory of his son. And this reality of what's happening to Jonah here in our story isn't the first time that we see it in the scriptures, and it isn't the last time. This man, when Peter's preaching at Pentecost, Delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. God orchestrating everything as it were behind the scenes. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Yes, there were men actually there that day stretching out Christ and hammering him into the cross. But it all happened because of the predetermined plan of God. God sent him there. And he went willingly in order to quench all the wrath that was due you and me. Joseph was sent to Egypt for the salvation of his people. Jonah sent into the belly of the well for the salvation of God's people. And Christ sent to the cross for the salvation of God's people. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. May God be merciful to us to hear the word of the Lord, to be committed to basking in the word of the Lord, taking in copious amounts of the scriptures so that we don't end up with a seared, ineffective conscience that makes us so dull to the voice of the Lord that we can't even acknowledge howling wind and booming thunder happening one level above us. Jonah was blind and deaf and clueless about what God was doing around him. And we can avoid that if we will humble ourselves and attempt with everything in us to walk with him in his word living according to his word, seeking to remain in his presence. My fear is that we forsake the lessons of Jonah chapter 1 in hopes of living the hero life of Jonah chapter 3. Jonah's no hero. He starts bad, he ends bad. It was a flash in the pan experience and God used him for a day, if you will. And that's no pattern for us to live by. The pattern is for us to avoid. The pattern that is said is the one of Christ. We humble ourselves and we walk with him seeking to be obedient to God's will, God's word, and God's ways. Let's pray.